the world turns. Brought to you by Instant Niagara and new Niagara Spray Starch, famous products of best food. There's a name for women like Jill Farron Phelps. Not that I'd use it outside of a kennel. Hi, it's Cola Booth. And as most of you already know, I have more than arms up these sleeves. <laughs> That's a famous line I wrote for Sammy Brady. But anyway, um, welcome to my show on the soap operas. It's been ages since I wrote for Days of Our Lives, Young and the Restless, and As the World Turns. Um, it was one of the most wonderful times because what you have to understand is that Harding LeMay, Agnes Nixon, Henry Slaysar, Douglas Marland, I learned English watching daytime soaps. Um, I am originally from Omdurman, Sudan. That's where I was born. I'm Egyptian Sudanese. I came to the United States when I was about six years old. And um, I absolutely uh, learned so much from daytime soap operas, especially my favorite soap opera, which was Another World. Mac, Rachel, Cecile, Cass Winthrop, um, Blaine, um, you know, um, Lenora Kasdorf. Um, it was just such a wonderful time growing up. Today I'm going to talk about what it was like to create the character of E.J. Wells Demera. And so many people have tried to dispute my um, work on the soaps and exactly what I've done. But the good thing about creating EJ is that there is published proof. Um, the New York Post featured me while I was giving birth to EJ, basically. I explained to them uh, what my motivation was for writing him and what he was going to be about. Um, and Stephen Wyman, who was um, the executive producer of Days of Our Lives, um, is the one who uh, had me write the Bible for EJ. And um, I actually cast the deciding vote to cast James Scott as EJ. And so I am very, very happy to be the mother of EJ Wells Demera, and I'm not going to let anyone take that away from me. Um, also today, I'm going to have a, like a little mini salute to who I feel is one of the greatest actresses in daytime and was never really given credit. And she has since become one of the most vocal and important activists, as far as I'm concerned, um, Victoria Rowell. For those who don't know it, Victoria Rowell has said very, you know, not so nice things about me. She doesn't really like me. But I'm still going to salute her because I love her so much. I loved her work. I forgive her for not knowing that I was a ghost writer at Young and the Restless at the time, during the time that she was there and um, was responsible for so many of the scenes that she was in and, and um, wrote so much of her stuff and worked on it and just um, really, really love Victoria uh, Rowell. And so I'm going to talk about her and I'm going to talk about how I can't stand Michelle Stafford who played Phyllis. And I'm going to let you know what a real bitch she is in real life. It's just my personal opinion of um, Michelle Stafford. I remember one of the first things I wanted to do when I um, became the writer of Days of Our Lives and I became the ghost head writer for several months. I wanted to do this huge story on Dr. Marlena Evans and um, I'll tell you why that story never made the air. Um, lots of people wondered how is she qualified to write daytime soaps. And um, aside from the fact that I had watched them and learned English from them and am a, a really good writer, um, 
This is what I told the New York Post in an interview when I was first hired. When, you know, it was asked why is she qualified. I'm not proud I was a kept woman, but I use a lot of what I went through with Osama bin Laden in my soap writing. Many of the women characters have deep, dark secrets, and I can relate to that. I've been sinful. I've been a villain. I've been desperate and hungry enough where I've had to make something happen. I know what it's like to be raped, to sleep with a rich man for his money, to have diamonds and furs. I know what it's like to be human and to need love. People want to know about James Riley. They want to know about Ken Corday, and they want to know why Ken Corday cussed out Brian Franz, who was head of soaps at ABC, over me. And so that's going to be really fun to talk about today. Um, I love my soap fans so much. I love that you are still into Cola Booth and that you always keep up with me and wonder what's going on with me. And um, today um, is going to just be a day for us who love soaps to enjoy our soaps. Gone Dreams of the past Gone with the love that moved too fast Gone Bright shiny days Gone in a young and restless haze Why did we love Pass this way again. Drink the summer wine. Reach for the stars while you have time. Your restless heart. A few years ago, the Atlanta Post ranked me as the fourth most successful black writer in America. Um, many people today know me because of the sexy part of the Bible, my breakthrough internationally acclaimed novel about skin bleaching in West Africa, a literary novel. Um, People are so snobby today, they're like, why would you want to be still associated with daytime soaps? Why don't you stop talking about that? But I'm not ashamed to be from the daytime soaps. I take it as a huge badge of pride. Um, I love the soaps. And um, I remember uh, the way that I came on the soaps, it was so shocking to me. And, and you just don't know, for someone from another country, uh, my parents were murdered in front of me when I was six years old. I was adopted, came to the United States, and learned English watching every day, days of our lives, The Doctors and Another World. That was the lineup of the three soap operas for me, at the original three. I later watched all my children and Young and the Restless and Ryan's Hope and all that, but 
those first three were the main ones. And um, to actually grow up and become a writer on Days of Our Lives was just unbelievable. It wasn't something I expected or planned. What happened is that I wrote a letter to uh, Stephen Wyman, who was the executive producer at Days, and um, by then I was um, an established writer. My book, Diary of a Lost Girl, um, a Princeton critic had chosen my book as the best book of the year. So that's major, you know, best book of the year from a Princeton critic. Um, my autobiography, Diary of a Lost Girl. And so Stephen Wyman, it turned out, had read my autobiography and knew how much I love soap operas, um, knew how Days of Our Lives is mentioned in the book. And he knew um, that I was also an amazing writer from reading my autobiography, so we had lunch. It wasn't for me to write on days or anything, it's just he was going to listen to my ideas because I was so... I had so many complaints about Days of Our Lives, and I just felt that changes should be made or the show's going to get cancelled. This is back in 2006. So in March 2006, I had lunch with Steve Wyman. Um, he and I, he loved my ideas, he loved my ideas, and he already, of course, loved my writing, and he's the right-hand man of Ken Corday, and, um, he said, well, Cola, why don't you come in and do, you know, he paid me to do some consulting on the show, is what it was supposed to be, and, um, so I came to the studio, um, it was Studio 4, I believe, in Burbank, at NBC Studios and um, I think the first day I came there and you know I was supposed to be supposedly coming to consult not write just give ideas well I came that day and I believe it was that first day that James Riley walked off the show you know I had already been in an email the night before where they had kind of introduced us I was on the email list with the other writers where what we do is we write the show by email and they would pool everybody together and so my name you know I was one of the email people in there just out of the blue and um, James Riley was okay with it but it turned out and he, his leaving had nothing to do with me it turned out that there was a war going on where Ken Corday who is the owner of the show his family had owned the show is Ken Corday and Stephen Wyman were um, really wanted to get rid of James Riley. They wanted to take the show in a more serious direction. They, you know, had different ideas for it. But NBC wanted Riley to stay there because he had brought them the ratings and done so much, and so they wanted to keep him. And so um, Riley just up and told everybody, fuck you, fuck off, kiss my fucking ass, lick my balls. I mean, literally. And just left the show. <laughs> but my favorite person at Days of Our Lives is Stephen Wyman, the executive producer. Because Stephen, and when Riley did that, I immediately, um, you know, because I was so close to Stephen, I was literally like in his office. The other writers were spread out wherever they were. <coughs> but I had his ear <coughs> and so I immediately began actually writing the show and you know it was just basically given cash right there on the spot here for this for that for that here's cash and just started you know doing everything um, contributing let's say that first two or three days and so um, they got rid of him and um, Stephen I felt Stephen Wyman was so great because Stephen Wyman wanted to bring new blood to soaps. He felt that they needed to get rid of all these writers and they have sort of an incestuous thing in soap operas where the same people just get converted and moved around and you know write and you know there's no new people coming in, no new blood. So Stephen really pushed me to Ken Corday. He had Ken look at my autobiography and the awards I had, you know, all the praise I had won and everything. And um, they kept saying stuff like, well, she looks like an actress. She doesn't look like 
a soap writer. You know, that was a big thing, a barrier for me to break because I mean, as I was introduced to the whole studio, <coughs> all the producers and executives and things, that was a constant thing was, you know, she has like 44 double D tits. She's like, you know, glamorous looking. She doesn't look like, you know, a writer. <laughs> And so that's the sexism that women go through is being, you know, judged on our looks. And so um, Stephen was like, but you've got to forget about how she looks. She's just the most ingenious writer. I mean, Stephen Wyman, you know, told everybody when I read her stuff, I can't stop reading it. You know, she's very addictive. Her writing is, you know, you start reading one page and these are scenes that I was writing for the show and ideas and things. And he's like, you can't, you know, you start reading one page and then boom, you just can't stop reading. And so Ken Corday agreed with him. This is like three days later. And um, if it was up to Steve Wyman, I think everybody would have been fired, basically. And because Steve wanted to go like to the fan boards and hire whoever had talent. And he really was looking for people who loved the soaps, who knew the family dynamics, who knew the history, who knew the characters. Steve Wyman's interest was really deep in that kind of way. He really wanted to bring in, you know, people who love, love, love soaps and who know how to write a scene and who know how to have good twists and turns and story and, and all that stuff. So if it was up to Steve, that was how, you know, he was like gorilla about it. Like, you know, let's get all these people out of here that are just, in Steve's mind, sort of um, old fogies. People who were just, uh, you know, getting a check and not really working, not really trying hard. Um, but he was just the greatest, the most greatest. And I just thought Steve Wyman had the best ideas. They never made it to the screen. His ideas, now, even though he was the executive producer, he could be overwritten. And then also was the thing is he's really not a writer. And so because he's not a writer, he had a hard time articulating what he wanted done. But I spent a lot of time talking to him and listening to him. And so because of that, his ideas crystallized more in my mind and I just thought that he was really really you know even though like I'm saying the stuff Steve thought of doing never did make the screen most of his changes and things didn't make it NBC vetoed a lot of what Steve you know even though he was executive producer what he thought should be done um, with casting and different things, you know, I don't think he got the kind of, because I think if he had gotten the support he needed and had more power, I think Days would have went much more into a classic mode of, you know, they would have won more awards and stuff, and at the same time, Steve wanted to bring in technology. He wanted to make, you know, the show look great. He was really into things that other people didn't think mattered much. He fought for the sets. He fought for the budget. He really wanted all that. But then I found out um, when I basically began Ghost Head writing the show, and the reason was because they offered it to Peter Brash. Peter Brash is a wonderful writer who used to be at Another World. And when I first came, I sent him this glowing, loving email telling him how much I idolized him and loved him. Never knew, you know, down the back, down the road, he stabbed me in the back and was really nasty and mean to me. But um, they had offered it to Steve Wyman. I mean, they had Steve Wyman had offered it to Peter Brash. And Peter, I mean, think of it this way. The head writer, James Riley, had just split. They needed someone to take over right away, and the person who they went to as their go-to said no, he didn't want the stress and pressure of it. Well, I was young and full of energy and just couldn't believe I had been asked to consult on the show, let alone now here I am at Burbank, and they're saying, oh, our writer left. <laughs> our writer left and you know what should we do what do we, we got to do something and so i was brought in um and basically worked directly with steve wyman 
and I just had hundreds of ideas and so they said Cola first the way this works you have to write a Bible which is like for the next two years of story you have this we're gonna give you this much time to write your Bible and that was at night in the daytime I would actually be writing on the show and the scripts and stuff that was actually already done what was being carried out um, one of the first things that I really wanted to do and um, this is where I found out you don't just, you know, soaps aren't where you just get to come in and put your vision out there and do things, you know. I think even Agnes Nixon went through this. And she did. Um, just because they are the head writer and everything and have autonomy doesn't mean they have direct power. Because I wanted to do a big story on Dr. Marlena Evans. Marlena Evans was my fa favorite character on Days of Our Lives. And... Um, I was immediately told to put her in as few episodes per month as possible. And it was because NBC felt she was too expensive. And NBC was trying to get the public used to not seeing her. So that they could fire her. You know, get rid of her because of the money that it cost to have her. And so, you know, it wasn't so much Ken and Steve, but they were the ones who had to tell me, look, hate to break it to you kid but we know how much you love Marlena and that's your favorite but we can't you know she can only be on we want her on as less episodes as possible and um, like I said it was really NBC the network because everything has to pass through the network and they constantly sent people from the network I remember one of the network ladies one of the first people I met from NBC, from the tower, so to speak, from, you know, the executive, was a woman. And um, her, she was really disappointed when she met me because she just looked at me and was like, you know, this is like, um, what did she say? Something to the effect of like a Playboy Playmate up in the offices instead of a writer. Is, you know, just that whole sexist thing that people had back then. Um, just you know I don't know I had cleavage and stuff like that and so it was just I don't know it was just that was what I remember most because they did a photo shoot of me and you know they wanted to downplay certain things and so you know it was just to me like that wasn't a good sign when people are looking at you like that not understanding that no matter what you look like if you have the talent and brilliance and intelligence, you know, I'm not stupid. I, I knew what I was doing, clearly. When I left the show, the ratings had went up to a 2.9. And I do take credit for that because that whole summer of 2006, going, you know, not the last two weeks, I'll have to give those to um, Beth Milstein came in. But going towards that last two weeks the first two weeks of august and before from april of 2006 till august i do take credit for the great ratings and the excitement and you know there was so much publicity unfortunately because tv guide outed that i was you know writing the show osama bin laden's former mistress unfortunately um, which is bad because the sponsors and, you know, Days of Our Lives is popular in the Bible Belt. It's not like All My Children, which was more of an urban popularity show. If I had been on All My Children, there probably wouldn't have been any problem and I may not have been fired. But at Days of Our Lives, um, the Bible Belt viewers are the core audience. And so there was a lot of people white Christian conservative people saying we don't care whether she was raped held against her will or whatever she was with Osama bin Laden and she could be lying maybe she liked it maybe she likes him and even though I'm not Muslim I was born a Sunni Muslim in Omdurman Sudan but I was raised Christian by my adoptive parents in America then when I grew up I started my own religion called the womb w-o-m-b the womb because I'm a feminist and I wanted my own spiritual thing more than because I don't really like religion but they don't care about all that if you were any kind of connected to Muslims then you're a Muslim forever that's just how their minds work and so um, 
they began to put a lot of pressure on NBC and Ken Corday. And Ken Corday fought it all the way. He was like, you're not taking cola from me. I just read her Bible. It is amazing. The show he felt was going to really go, you know, and I just had this energy and vitality that they love because other writers <coughs> felt overworked. <coughs> other writers felt like, you know, they're pressuring us to do so much in such a short time because of, you know, how quickly the show had to be shot and this and that but I was so new and fresh and young and happy to be you know working on the show that I learned English watching that you know I would get so many pages you know like they had to shorten my Bible and I had just done so much stuff whole each character really each major character I wrote a Bible for but um, they were really pleased with my writing and we had a lot of meetings because a lot of it unfortunately um, was very controversial for in 2006. Tanya Boyd who played Celeste, she's one of my favorites on the show, I just love Tanya Boyd, beautiful, beautiful woman and great actress. Well I wanted to give Celeste a whole lot to do actually because I wanted to bring in her son that she didn't know she had and then I wanted her to be against her son marrying a dark-skinned black girl um, because I wanted to use I wanted to do a story on black colorism you know <coughs> but <coughs> at the time Abe and Lexi uh, Lexi was cheating on Abe with some good-looking hot guy who couldn't act worth a damn tech Lexi was cheating with Tech and Abe was going to find out now that I was on the show and I wanted to have Abe go mad because something had happened to Abe with his vision a year ago earlier so I said great we'll have his brain start malfunctioning once he finds out this horrible thing that his wife is sleeping with Tech and we will have Abe beat Lexi up to where she dies not die but I wanted him to put her in a coma just horrible beat up and they were like, oh my God, you know, Ken Corday really tried to get NBC to back me on that. But NBC was like, we don't want to have her husband, you know, we want to keep the sympathy on him, which is what I thought we shouldn't do. But anyway, because um, I just felt Abe and Lexi need to break up. They're boring as hell. And so I was going to have him put her in a coma and put her in the hospital. But this was the really controversial thing that NBC had to be called in on was that I wanted um, Celeste to say, nigga, please, you know, in an argument with Abe where he is confused and trying to explain what happened and why he beat her, you know, beat up her daughter like that and everything. I wanted Celeste to just look at him and go, nigga, please, you know. And um, I felt since a black woman is writing it, you know, America can't be upset and nobody can say anything because I'm writing it. It's my idea. But NBC shot it down. They said, you can't do that. And then I wanted to have Will, Sammy's son, be gay. And they approved it. NBC approved it. So if I had not been fired, that was one of the big stories that was coming in the fall was that I was going to have Will start being picked on by kids at school and beating them up and the whole thing was going to start where Sammy doesn't understand why every few days Will gets sent home for beating up somebody at school. At first I kind of wanted to look like Will is a bully who you know just enjoys beating up his classmates and then as we got deeper into it we were going to find out oh the kids call him fag and they call him this and they call him that and then Sammy was going to find out the reason the kids do all that is because Will had written a love note to a male teacher. And from there we were going to have it turn out that Will is gay. And then there was going to be a really major shock a few months later in my Bible where Will was in bed with a major male character from the show and um, who's married. And this other guy who I had who wanted Will for himself took pictures and were blackmailing Will and the major character who I can't tell you because it never made it and 
But anyway, um, that was my storyline. So long before Days made Will Gay, Cola Booth had got permission from NBC to do it. The thing I'm most proud of, of course, though, is my baby, E.J. Demira, E.J. Wells Demira, who was a race car driving gigolo the way I had written him. And I just was given by Stephen Wyman a slip of white paper that James Riley had gave to Steve because they were saying, what are we going to do? They didn't want to bring Stefano Demira back because of cost, but they wanted to bring him back. It was something of that. And so James Riley had gave Steve Wyman this sheet of paper. It was a white sheet of paper and it just said EJ on it. And um, Steve gave the paper to me and I knew that EJ was the son of Stefano and, um, oh, why won't her name come to me? But you know, you remember the crazy lady that um, was on the show years before. So anyway, I wanted to bring her back, you know, and that was going to be a November sweeps, November of 2006 sweeps thing, was that we were going to have EJ's actual mother um, come back to the show. But anyway, um, he said, here the name is EJ. And so I wrote a Bible for EJ called The Devil Finds Work. The Devil Finds Work told the whole story of E.J. Wells, who absolutely hated his father, Stefano, and was determined to destroy his father's mansion and to kill his father. He also, however, wanted to get revenge for his mother, who was in an, an insane asylum. I wish her name would come to me. But he wanted to get revenge on his for his mother on everyone in Salem. And so he was going to make Sammy Brady... Uh, fall in love with him so that he could destroy the Brady family. That was his main, main first prerogative, uh, first priority was that he was going to destroy the Brady family. The New York Post actually came while I was on the show working on creating EJ. This is before he aired or anything and the New York Post, which I'm so glad because people, you know, try to take credit or deny you credit for your work later. I didn't realize that would happen, but writers have done that. But the EJ, po the New York Post did a whole story on me creating EJ. So um, I wrote the, the Devil Finds Work, the Bible of EJ Demira. Um, they started auditioning and looking at a hundred, you know, EJ was going to be really the centerpiece of our new show without James Riley. EJ was the beginning of, you know, so many changes. And um, we saw that character as the centerpiece. He was going to be involved in everybody's storyline. The entire city of Salem, basically, was going to be being terrorized by this gigolo, you know, and not knowing it at first. Um, he seemed so disarming and everything. And so we had to have a star character actor. I mean, we had to have somebody who could really, really do all this and be handsome and dashing at the same time. And what you have to understand is that I knew Osama bin Laden, not as a, I knew him personally. So when I said that, I wasn't speaking of, <coughs> you know, Americans tend to have this cartoon, one dimensional, that's a terrorist murder killer. But I had been asked to create a hot, truly hot villain. And what better villain than Osama? Because in real life, I know what a genius Osama is. I know how cunning and genius and sensitive. Osama never yelled. You know, Osama cried when he ordered someone to be killed. I watched it over and over again. Osama wrote the most beautiful poetry in the world. And so I knew all that about Osama bin Laden. So when I said that he would be a cross between Osama bin Laden and James Bond, I was speaking on um, the genius, the sensitivity, the um, all these things that make 
dastardly villains interesting and exciting is the humanity part of them. And I'm not saying that I loved, because, you know, I never loved Osama bin Laden. I didn't choose to be with Osama bin Laden. It was against my will. I didn't like Osama bin Laden. Just get all that shit straight. I'm a human being. Nobody wants to be with these kind of all-powerful gangster men. But when you are an attractive woman, you catch their eye and they take over your life. That becomes your life. Women don't have, you know, in the Arab world, I had no one to run to. The police turned him over to, turned me over to him when I ran to the police. But that was what I originally envisioned EJ to be a much more <coughs> classy, terrifying, um, archaic, aristocratic type character. I wanted him to have I wanted him to be a lot more like Victor Newman on Young and the Restless. I wanted EJ to be much more like Victor Newman was what, how I had envisioned and written his character. And you know, slowly but surely, the first he came, he comes on the show, and I did that whole intro where they open the door and the um, towel falls off. Because I told Ken Corday, we have to do something to make women viewers know that, hey, this guy's packing, he's hung, he's fine, he's just, you know. And so they said, okay, Cola, we'll have, the way I originally wanted was somebody to say it to Kate. But um, they said, no, what we can do is we'll just have his towel drop and the expression on Sammy's face will tell everything. So that's how we ended up doing it. But, um, oh, when it was time to cast James Scott, um, to cast the character, I'm proud because I got to be the one to give the deciding vote. Um, Stephen Wyman thought that James Scott was perfect. That was who he really wanted to be, uh, EJ. And some other people, however, had some other people in mind. You know, um, each actor kind of had their fan of who wanted who to be EJ. And so I was the one who said, it's James Scott. I mean, he was the personification of everything I had been writing. And so I was just so overjoyed and happy when James Scott was cast in the role of E.J. DeMira. One of the big things that happened while I was writing Days is that I had helped out on an episode of One Life to Live <coughs> and was talking to Brian Franz. What it is, is they just want to get to know you so that when you leave that soap, they can see if they want to bring you to one of their soaps. So it's not so much they wanted to take me away from Days of Our Lives. It was more that everyone was shocked that a new writer from nowhere who was nowhere in the business, nowhere in the soap community had been brought in. And so, you know, they wanted to kind of know who I was. And so Brian Franz, who I had done some minor work on One Life to Live episode, tried to offer me money to buy the Bible that I wrote for Days of Our Lives. So I told Steve, Steve Wyman, and Steve told Ken Corday, and oh my God, that is one of the most unknown moments in soap opera history when Brian Franz got the phone call from Ken Corday. Ken Corday was going to beat his ass. I mean, it was that serious. This, this is no lie. This is no exaggeration. No, uh-uh. Ken Corday was like, you know, I will take down ABC itself. You know, you don't bribe my writers and offer her $50,000 for, you know, a copy of the Bible. You know, and so um, that was one of the major, big, dramatic things that happened while I was writing on the show. Um, we were extremely happy campers at first because the ratings went through the roof and we were worried about the publicity, but the publicity drove the ratings through the roof. All the publicity I'm saying over Osama Bin Laden's mistress writing the show, um, that was like late May of 2006 where I was in the New York Post and tons of other news stuff. It was just the biggest thing on the internet because that's where the world really now, you know, congregates. And so on the internet, the story of me being, you know, 
put to write the show became just ginormous. It was out there everywhere. Um, the ratings went up. And then the thing that I didn't count on but that I should have expected was that all the sponsors and everything started to pressure Ken Corday and NBC and before I knew it, Jif Peanut Butter and Tide Detergent insisted that I be fired. That, you know, we can't support a show that has Osama Bin Laden's mistress writing it. And so that became a huge, huge, huge issue. Um, and like I said, after Tide Detergent and and Jif Peanut Butter became so insistent, um, there was a lot going on, but I got, and Peter Brash um, started bad-mouthing me to the soap press and to different people and sending emails um, saying really bad things that were just horrible. And, um, a lot of people think Ken Corday really, really um, was for me being fired. He wasn't. I want you to know, Ken Corday is the sweetest, nicest guy. He may not be the smartest, in my opinion, at how a soap, in my opinion, should be run. Because I'm from the Bill Bell, Harding LeMay, Agnes Nixon. That kind of soap writing is what I like to do. Now, granted, my stories are over the top as well in certain ways, but my stories are over the top more like a Betty Davis movie. More like the way that, you know, Rachel and Steve were over the top on another world back in their heyday. Um, I wasn't for all the science fiction stuff. I felt that James Riley was just too slow as molasses in the execution. And you'll notice in April of 2006, Days started moving lickety split fast. I mean, it was the pace of the show became outrageously fast. And that was me. That was me wanting to get all the um, material of James Riley out there. His stories ended, if you notice, a lot of his stories wrapped up. And then we segued into what I was going to be doing. But anyway, at the time, right before, like a week before, NBC insisted that I be fired and everything. Ken Corday and Stephen Wyman hired Hogan Sheffer from, he had been like four times, he four time Emmy winner at As the World Turns. They hired Hogan Sheffer to take over Days of Our Lives and they wanted to announce me at that time. When he came on, it was going to be written by Hogan Sheffer and Cola Booth. That was the the idea, the agreement and everything. Hogan had already read my Bible and loved it and um, <coughs> wanted us to work together as a team. And so that was the way that we were going to do it. Now, in the way that that's done, they basically have like, because NBC wanted someone, they didn't want a black woman writing the show is what it was, NBC. This is before this, I haven't gotten to where the sponsors yet. Let's back up a week before. NBC had this whole thing about, you know, it's like an all white show. Why is a black woman, an African black woman writing the show? And so Steve and Ken loved my Bible and loved all my ideas and loved my work and said, we want Cola to, you know, this is daring, yes, but we want to come out with her as the head writer. And so NBC said, no, you've got to put her with somebody so it'll be more acceptable. We can slide it by more with our viewers and everything if, you know, and, and this is really true how racial America is and how racial the dynamics of daytime. There's so many white writers who are in line who can't understand why out of the just nowhere, you know, literally out of the jungle, they went and got this black African woman writer. So they were going to pair me and Hogan Sheffer, and that was the way they were going to bring us in. But I would still be Ken and Steve's voice. You know, it was me, Ken, and Steve, and then Hogan Sheffer like that, with me, Ken, and Steve over here in tandem of what we wanted to do. And then we would work with Hogan Sheffer to, you know, that was the plan. But then a week later, Jeff and Tide came in and it just blew out of proportion. 
um, it's called sun.com. It was like, is it um, soapopernetwork.com? The most racist assholes run sun.com and they were constantly campaigning for me to be fired, constantly writing the most ridiculous, bitchiest, anti, out of jealousy, jealous that none of them were, you know, picked to write on a daytime soap, jealous that this black woman, and so much of it was racist, of the shit that they were saying and doing and lies that they made up about me. I mean, I was so busy writing, how would I have time to be online you know, gossiping. And they had all these stories and lies of me gossiping and made up stuff of me gossiping and just bullshit. But they were really campaigning for me to be kicked off the show. They had written enormous letters behind the scene, um, constantly telling, you know, everybody. And it's just something white people do. <coughs> I mean, it's just really how it is. I'm not going to talk about the actresses on the show who complained about a black woman writing them because I love those actresses and I'm a huge fan and have always liked them so I'm not going to go into detail about those three women and things that they said but it was just shocking to me how white people's true colors come out and just it really hurt Steve Wyman who just adored me and thought I was a great writer that was his whole thing there was no kind of hanky panky or anything like that and he felt really bad when, as he's executive producer of the show, he felt bad when people made comments or things that were racial. But there's no way to deny it. It's a very racist medium, the daytime soaps. Very racist. And it's really because of the competition they already have amongst the whites themselves to get jobs, to be the head writer, to be this. So if a black person comes in and gets considered for something, their first thing as competing for whatever it is is oh that person's black and guiding light is all white why would you you know they don't under they couldn't understand a black person being in charge of writing and creating story for whites so anyway i got fired from days of our lives Shortly after being fired from Days, I went on to the greatest acclaim of my career for writing the novel, The Sexy Part of the Bible. People who read The Sexy Part of the Bible always say things like, I can't believe you wrote for soaps. You're such a great writer. You're so this, you're so that. The Boston Globe called The Sexy Part of the Bible one of the best books of the year. Madison Smart Bell, who was once nominated for the National Book Award, called the book one of the best books of the year. Um, it was highly acclaimed by Booklist, Publishers Weekly, um, Time Out Chicago, the San Francisco newspapers. I mean, it was just very acclaimed novel. So people who read it um, don't understand that my basics started with Harding LeMay, Pat Falcon Smith, Bill Bell, Agnes Nixon, Henry Slaysar, you know, um, as good as I am as a literary novelist, my roots started with old Hollywood women's pictures like, you know, All About Eve and, and daytime soap operas. So um, I'm grateful to those people. When we come back, I'm going to talk about moving to Young and the Restless and As the World Turns, Michelle Stafford and Victoria Ra uh, Rowell. And right now, here's a little walk down memory lane as you watch literally what my day was like as a little kid. Um, the three soap operas that I learned to speak English from.
doctors will return in just a moment. The Doctors is brought to you in part by the Colgate Palmolive Company, makers of Dermasage. And now, the continuing story of another world. And now, the continuing story of another world. Harding LeMay, Agnes Nixon, Douglas Marlin, Pat Falcon Smith, Henry Slesar, Bill Bell. I love you so much. I owe you so much for the success of the sexy part of the Bible. Osama bin Laden. He asked me. What was it like on a day to day basis being Osama bin Laden's mistress? mistress of Osama bin Laden is sharing her pillow talk. Uh, you've had an astounding life. I, I want to first ask you, when you met... This Sunday, January 5th, everything about Osama bin Laden. What was it like to live with Osama bin Laden? What was it like to go hunting with him, to have sex with him? What was it like to be abused by him? This Sunday, January 5th, your questions will be answered in my special Osama Bin Laden episode of my video blog. That's Sunday, January 5th. Everything about Osama Bin Laden. There's just so much that I want people to know. So, um, there was so much publicity around my firing that Sony Pictures figured, you know, this girl has charisma, she's exciting, she gets publicity, we can't just let her go. And so I was moved over to The Young and the Restless, you know, because Days of Our Lives and so, uh, Days of Our Lives and Young and the Restless are both at Sony Pictures. So they moved me over there, still ghostwriting as a ghostwriter. I also had did two actual scripts for Days of Our Lives that aired. Um, as, as well as ghostwriting Days of Our Lives, I did two, like, you know, episodic scripts that aired. And then I was let go. I went to um, Young and the Restless, and um, I had much, much less input at Young and the Restless. I was basically writing the black characters on the show, is what they had me um, contributing to which meant Victoria, Raoul, Drusella, and you know, all those characters. And um, I just want to take this moment to say, because apparently uh, Victoria Raoul was not aware of that at the time that it was happening. But um, she was and is one of my favorite of all time actors in daytime. I just think that her talent has been so unappreciated and underrated she is as good as Erica Kane or Dr. Marlena Evans or uh, Nikki on Young and the Restless or any of the great actresses, um, Kim from Guiding Light, um, Kim Zimmer. Um, you know, she's just absolutely fabulous, Victoria Rowell, and was true star quality, truly magnetic could read pages and pages of script like it was, you know, her own daily breath. I mean, like it was just real. You never for a minute caught Victoria Rowell acting. She really embodied her character and pulled you in and just made you really, really into it. Um, two things happened that I really hated at Young and the Restless. Um, Michelle Stafford, who played Phyllis, she spit on Victoria Rowell one day. She was just a nasty bitch. There was a lot of incidences with Michelle Stafford. I personally feel she had, and you know, black people on soaps go through so much from not having, from having to come in and do your own hair, your own makeup and all that kind of stuff. You don't get the same kind of support white actors get because you're usually one of only a few, you know, they don't have that many black people. But to add insult to injury is the attitude that 
you know, some white actors and people get when you want to express your same amount of talent. When you're like, I want to have more scenes. I want to do this. I want to play more. I'm a really good performer. I want to be on screen. And Victoria Rowell definitely was a star um, and is a star, a real life star. She can't help it. It's just who she was born to be. She's one of the greatest one of the greatest ever in daytime and there was a lot of jealousy against Victoria and people tried to make her out to be this you know bad person this villainous when all she wanted was to flex her talent show off her talent just like any other star um, and she was just mistreated by people and lied on by people and uh, Michelle Stafford was just an evil bitch and she was one of those people who you know in my opinion um, you know it was just terrible what went on there and then the black girl there was a beautiful beautiful dark-skinned black girl who played Lily and they got rid of her and brought back that white-looking girl who just never made sense to me I mean and this is the colorism of the daytime soaps they were going to make Lily be in an interracial relationship, so they wanted to bring in a woman who looks white to play a black woman in an interracial relationship. You know, it just is like we don't want the controversy, but we want to pretend like we are invested in, you know, this racial love story. And it was just such bullshit. And that actress who plays Lily has never been right for that part. Her father's dark black. Drusilla was dark black. This girl has no soul. She's there to appease certain viewers who just don't want to see major stories featuring a black woman. Um, the last thing I want to say before I go is that I am so happy that I was instrumental at As the World Turns where I had my less amount of work to do. It was at Televest, was the company, and I was basically doing consulting. And um, I was happy that Christopher Goutman hired Austin Peck to, because Austin had got fired from Days of Our Lives around the same time, be either before me shortly, that I did. And so when I moved to doing consulting at As the World Turns, I was able to convince uh, a few people there that, you know, Austin Peck would be just awesome in the role. Um, and so he got the part at As the World Turns because of me and um, I loved I just want to give a shout out to when I was a kid Petronia Paley who played Quinn Harding on Another World I love you you were so graceful beautiful and wonderful and meant everything to me as a little black African girl watching Another World Petronia Paley who p played Quinn Harding <coughs> And also a shout out to Wanda Coleman, the first black woman writer in daytime to win an Emmy. In 1976, Wanda Coleman, a black woman, um, and she died, passed away this year, but she won an Emmy for writing Days of Our Lives. And as far as I know, me and Wanda are the only two black writers that Days of Our Lives ever had. I'm not sure, but I'm so proud that Wanda won an Emmy and made history um, for us. I also want to send out a shout out to one of the greatest daytime actresses of all time from Generations. Generations was the black soap opera that didn't quite make it, but it got good at the end. But the star of that show, one of the best black actresses ever, was Janelle Allen, who played Doreen. Janelle Allen played Doreen on Generations and she was just amazing and I just want to shout her out as well. I love daytime soaps. I really do wish that we could go back to the time when veterans mattered, when there was real subtext. Um, as a literary novelist, as someone who grew up weaned on Harding LeMay, Henry Sleesar, Agnes Nixon, that level of writing, Pat Falk and Smith. Um, I wanted to bring really, really strong, shocking stories to daytime, but at the same time, I wanted to have a lot of social 
um, commentary and I wanted to have a lot of realism and just old fashioned, old school Hollywood drama. The kind that has you sitting on the edge of your seat wanting to watch that next episode of the show, wanting to uh, go there. And um, we've lost that in daytime soaps. They don't have the class and drama and cinema, cinematic quality of watching, you know, a good old Hollywood film, um, which is what I feel like it should be each day. Um, classic Another World is a good example of what I wanted to bring to Days of Our Lives. I really wanted the show to be character driven. I wanted to be all about families and I wanted to have it to constantly challenge and shock the audience and raise major questions about all kinds of issues that I wanted to introduce. Um, I felt the show should be fast paced, exciting, sexy, ahead of its time and groundbreaking. You know, I think I felt that implants, breast implants needed to be brought into the narrative. I felt that uh, black people's uh, self-hatred, colorism would make a good story. I felt reverse racism because I was going to have a black character accuse Maggie Horton of calling her the N-word and when she didn't. You know, she was lying on Maggie Horton and, you know, selling her reputation in Salem and so I wanted to have that story where the woman's uh, daughter ended up revealing that her mother had lied on on Maggie Horton. So I had all kinds of stories that I felt were different, new, and interesting that should be on the landscape. Um, soaps are not going to survive in the current state that they're in. You have to let in new blood, new people. And right now, they are just really not, um, they're not addictive enough. The characters don't have enough subtext. We don't feel like these people are our family. You know, we don't feel like an urgent need that we must find out what's going on with them and that we must watch them. And very little is happening on soap operas that surprise us. If you've ever read a Cola Booth novel, then you know that the execution of the story for me is everything. How the information is little by little given out to the reader to get the reader hooked and dying to know what's going to happen next and constantly surprising the reader. And that's what I told Steve Wyman and Ken Corday at Days of Our Lives is that every day we need to focus on um, what we're going to do um, with the execution of the show, getting people so revved up and then having them like, damn, I've got to watch this tomorrow to find out what happened and what's going to happen. So this has been my trip down memory lane. A lot of stuff was edited out of this and replaced with small talk for legal reasons. There was just a lot of stuff that I could not say and talk about. But um, I thank you for watching it. Make sure you download this episode just in case someone like Michelle Stafford gets it taken off. Make sure that you, you know, because I just gave my personal opinion of working at you know, the show. But um, make sure that you download it. Tomorrow, I'm going to talk in depth about my experience being the mistress of Osama Bin Laden. That's tomorrow's video blog episode, um, which probably will be end up being today because this is going to be posted so late that you'll probably see this episode Sunday morning. And then late Sunday night, the Osama Bin Laden episode will finally go up. So... <coughs> Thank you for watching. As always, I end the show with a quote that I made famous from one of my old Arabic films from the 90s. Me love you long time. This is Search for Tomorrow. This portion brought to you by Extra Fresh Liquid Prell. For freshness they'll notice today and tomorrow.